Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Another introduction since Carlos has finished with his introduction uh, for Kiwi PyCon this year in September. Um, thanks for coming tonight online and in person. We've done a few talks about user interfaces in Python over the years. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about something that uh, one thing that um, David, who is online, I believe, um, sent me a while ago, and something else that I came across just by accident the other day, actually. And I thought, oh, that might be actually worthwhile having maybe a look see and see what it's like. So, once again, tonight, user interfaces, what you can do in there. Um, cool. So, what we've done so far over the years was basically two things, either desktop applications or web-based. Um, for desktop applications, we had Tekinta, which is bundled basically with any Python download. Um, so you can basically do simple um, desktop applications straight away. I find it terrible to work with. Anything that's a little bit more complicated, you, you, you're going to be, well, toothless after a while. Um, GTK, which actually works quite nicely on the Linux, but um, in the olden days, you could actually download uh, executables which installed um, GTK on a Windows box, uh, but I found out that it's no longer the case. You have to sort of like download things and install and whatnot, so it's terrible actually building something. Um, and you actually have massive downloads to get something going. So if you want to do something cross-platform, maybe not so. But if it's on Linux, not a bad idea. PyQt, um, the Qt framework, um, which is cross-platform, which is nice too, also object-oriented. Um, like GTK and Linux. Um, and there's Kiwi if you want to do cross platform, but not only like Linux, Mac, and um, Windows, but also Android. You can do also development for that. Uh, it may not be the fastest, but at least you can basically develop one application for all platforms then. And then, of course, web based, uh, since we have browsers pretty much on any platform nowadays, which is uh, usually not a bad idea. And for that, usually Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so that's what we've done so far. And Jupyter Notebooks are quite nice for teaching, um, for web development or for development. I personally am not a fan of that because it's too much of spaghetti code that you write. And um, I was hearing from one of the participants that their partner was extremely fond of it. However, they had a particular order in which the cells needed to be run in order for everything to work. So I thought that's not very straightforward. So I'd rather not do something like that. But anyway, each to their own. But, of course, there's always more, and there's actually gazillions out there. So, I mean, it's a, on the one thing, great that you have actually choices compared to Windows um, sometimes. But on the other hand, it can be also very confusing, and you don't know actually which one to use, which one's still going to be around in a number of years, and so on. However, tonight we're just going to look at two that are not so common. So, one is Grad Isle. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, which is sort of like a web-based thing, and a terminal-based one, which is called textual, very appropriately named. Um, and that's um, if you really want to just do stuff rather than fancy browser, you do something in a terminal. Um, sort of like hmm, back to where sort of like old dinosaurs like me actually started in, um, and um, then only later on to moved on to graphical user interfaces. And... There we go. So, Grad.io, its use case is basically building demos for some of your software and to share them. So, you have something, so you have to think of it, it's mostly, the, the biggest use case is you have some kind of input and whatever you do transforms your input and generates some output. Or, for instance, dumps something into a database or pulls something out of a database. So, they basically have an easy way of quickly sort of like bootstrapping a user interface for that so it, people don't have to use the command line or something or uh, it makes it just easier selecting uh, images, colors, and things like that. So what happens there is you have basically a function and that gets wrapped in a web-based interface. And um, the input parameters of your method, there's a mapping happening with how you define basically that application. And then also whatever you return, whether it's just a single value or a tuple of multiple values, then this gets sort of like then displayed as well. 
In terms of input types, it has actually quite a large range. I've only written some down. So you can input, of course, the om omnipresent sort of like text, numbers, checkboxes, and you can have groups of checkboxes. Uh, you can select files. You can have sort of like a slider from, from a min to a maximum. Um, you can have your drop down for choices. Uh, you can pick colors. So great when you want to do some, I mean, that's a fine, particularly great for uh, a user interface because figuring out a hex code on the command line or whatnot is not the greatest. So that's actually quite a good one. You can have audio, so you can either upload, play and whatnot audio. You can select images, you can select videos, and I think also play them. You can work with data frames, so it's basically tabular data. Um, you can also work with time series data, and I've seen also that you can work with um, certain types of 3D models. Not something that I usually do, so I didn't look into that. And in terms of outputs, it's most of what we have as input types. But we can also then generate bar plots, line plots, or generic plots via matplotlib. Um, we can generate a gallery, or for instance, if you're receiving something from an API back, you can also just plain sort of like in, uh, display JSON then as well. So in case you have any questions, um, interrupt me. Um, same for the audience. Um, I'll be talking first of through a few slides and then sort of like jump into a little uh, demo of some of the examples um, that are out there and then sort of like go through and then we can have a look at that. Did you see any SVG? Um, no, to be honest. Um, it was mostly, so the image stuff, so I'm going to have an example there. So when you select an image, it automatically gets transformed into a NumPy array and then sort of like passed in like that. So you don't have to deal with any upload, anything. So it loads it straight up. Here's your NumPy array with whatever dimensions you have and then do something with it and return NumPy array again. And you have an image and it gets displayed. But I haven't seen anything. Um, but you might have a look whether there's actually something in there, whether it's possible. Um, but from a data science point of view, quite often, I think it's sort of like more this type of data, like with image, because where they're coming from is it was mainly about having an easy way that you can sort of like test your deep learning model, for instance, image classification or object detection and whatnot. So you upload an image and you display what comes out. So that I think is sort of like the origin of that particular framework. And then they extend it into all kinds of things. So in theory, we're going to see that as well. In terms of basics, um, so one thing that I ran into it, um, when you're doing things in a virtual environment, you also have to run in an activated virtual environment. Um, what I normally do when I run virtual environments, I just point basic to the Python interpreter. However, since that's um, spawning processes, that basically loses that environment then if you don't have that particular environment activated. So and that doesn't quite work. And I was sitting there and not doing anything. I thought, that's weird. Anyway, sort of like little um, pitfalls that keep you awake at night. Um, but it's really easy to install. I mean, it's just the typical pip install, grad IO. Pulls in quite a few dependencies. Um, I did a pip freeze after the install and had 62 basically dependencies in there. I think it starts out if you're empty, like with, I don't know, four or five dependencies. So it, it adds a few. Um, and if you add other things like deep learning frameworks, then the whole thing is brought a little bit, but that's all right. Um, there's basically, um, to start off, one main class to build your interface. And of course, it's called interface um, in the module grid IO. Um, and in order for your, so this class you instantiate, and then you define basically What's the function that you actually want to push through? So that's with the fn parameter. You can have either a single input parameter or a list of input parameters. And then sort of like mapping sort of like also the outputs that your method then actually generates as well. And you define that. And then you can basically just start launch the whole thing um, basically via that grad IO executable. And that's your application, just a simple Python file. And then you go on the browser, point to that URL, not the usual 8000 or 8080. I was a bit surprised. 
<clears throat> but they probably ran into that uh, problem that they run out of, oh, I have so many other things running on port 8000 already. How about we just start somewhere lower and have actually more space to fill up? So really, really easy. And the Hello World is absolutely basic. So, so what you see here is you basically just import Brad.io. Um, you have your method that once uh, basically gets an input, which is your name, and just returns another string. Uh, hello, whoever it is. Um, here's the interface class, which you instantiate, pointing to your greet method. Just a single input, um, and there's two ways also of doing it, either just a simple one, I just want to have text, or you can also then reference it sort of like a shortcut for a particular object that you could instantiate or a class that you instantiate and then actually have in there as well to have more styling and other things. And output is also text. And then you basically just do download or launch, and that's your app.py, and you run that, and you get a web interface, and that's it. So really, really easy. Don't worry, we'll see that in a minute. Um, if you want to have multiple input and output, so in this case, our method has now three inputs. So the name that we already had, and whether it's morning or not, and the temperature, temperature in Fahrenheit. And um, so we are then basically um, generating a string that we want to return. So either good morning or good evening. Um, and what the temperature is. And then we're also calculating sort of like the temperature in Celsius degrees, and then do return the greeting um, and the Celsius degrees as our output. And as you can see now, the inputs is now a list rather than just a single value, but for simplicity, we still have text and checkbox in there, but now rather than a text for slider, um, what you want to do is, with a slider, you usually want to define what the min and max is, especially with temperature. I mean, Fahrenheit, zero degrees Fahrenheit is quite low, so we can probably say that's fine. And 100 degrees Fahrenheit is quite hot. So for a human, that's a reasonable range that we can start with. But you can have it basically whatever range you want to. And your outputs, um, the greeting, which is text, and the degree Celsius, which is a number. So it's those two. And then slightly different. So we have here with if name equals main, then demo launch. So the reason that you started with the grad IO executable is that it has basically a hot reload. So if you change the code, it automatically reloads things. So you don't have to restart the application all the time. So you can still do your same thing with um, console scripts and whatnot if you don't want to rely on that. So you can just integrate that sort of like in your application like that and can you can have a command line utility for starting that web interface in as well. So you don't have to uh, use Great IO at all. And what a point uh, sort of like we done already before was so you can Peter, either have sorry. Peter, could we go back to the previous slide please? That one? Yeah, is there a reason why demo is in the in the um, position it's in and not under the if name? Why why is why is demo in the global yeah, scope? No particular reason. That was just the um, example as I grabbed it off the web there from the example page. There's no particular reason for that. Thank you. Rightly pointed out. Um, so once again, you can basically instantiate your types either simple with no sort of like customization via text, image, number, and so on, or you use basically a widget then basically. So, um, oh, sorry, a type. This is text, and I want to have like maximum length of that and a default value of that and whatnot or I want to have an image and I want to limit it to the size that I'm going to display and all kinds of things that you can then actually do with it. Um, you can have reactive interfaces. I've only looked at the live one um, where 
you, as soon as you, for instance, change text fields or click on buttons, radio group buttons and all these things, it automatically, with every change, it basically calls your method and it will update basically whatever comes out at the other end, if it's possible. Um, with the streaming one, that's probably for video processing, I presume. I haven't looked into that, but there's also some examples there. Um, and if the top level interface class is not quite powerful enough for what you want to do, um, there's something called Blocks, which is sort of a low level API, which gives you sort of like more, um, more flexibility in terms of what layouts you want to do and um, how you want to structure. Um, your interface, and then you can do things with it. Documentation is amazing, I have to say. So, I mean, I started with that last night. I gave it basically a spin for an hour, and it really makes sense. It's great. They basically describe all the different things. They usually have an example with that, how that works. So, what you're going to see now is basically the examples, not mine. Uh, I have one example that I sort of like cobbled together this afternoon, but. Um, um, that's what we're going to see. Um, David, do you have your haste, uh, hand still raised? No. Um, oh. Sorry about that. It's disappeared from my screen. Um, oh, okay. Hold on, my hand. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And... Makes it full screen. Okay, cool. All right, um, I'm just going to quickly switch over to um, share my screen. Full screen. Okay, so I'm just going to start with the um, um, first Hello World um, example that we had. Um, uh, Activate um, that virtual environment, and then I have great IO and I'm gonna run Hello World. Okay, copy the link. Oops. Make that a little bigger, so nice and mobile friendly, most likely as well. So if I change the dimensions here, so it will also work on your phone. So no worries there. Cool. Okay. So you can see on the left hand side I have my inputs. On the right hand side I have my outputs. Um, so I can um, put in a name, submit, and then it outputs pretty much immediately. Uh, ends of pack. So really, really simple. There's another feature, flag. Um, what that does, it will create a flag subdirectory, and then um, output a little CSV file that a particular input got flagged to something. For instance. Once again, that's the use case when people are testing so, or demoing their machine learning models. Whoa, that was a bit funny. I think you might want to look into that. So you can then basically have a little log file for things that actually happen. But it's really someone has to press the button flag. Um, I thought that was sort of kind of neat. Cool. Um, so yeah, five lines of code. And you basically have a web interface for input and output. And I thought, like, so holy moly, <laughs> that is pretty good. Um, coming from Javaland, uh, I would say, okay, so you have X number of dependencies, then you have to have a build file, and you have to have blah, 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 blah. Three days later, woohoo, it's still not working. So, yeah, having that basically going after a few minutes is great. 
okay. Um, we're looking at the multiple input and output. Um, this case um, is, so theoretically we can move that somewhere else, but we'll just run it as is. Inputs, outputs. So, gonna refresh that. So, once again, left and right hand side, and now we have sort of like our name again in the pack. Uh, it's definitely not morning. Um, I don't know what's the temperature roughly here in Fahrenheit, but. Warmish. Let's let's just say um, I don't know. Is it sort of like sixty-five, um, seventy. Let's just say. Anyway, I can then submit that, and then good morning, uh, good evening, and the pack at seventy degrees today, or twenty-one point one degrees Celsius. It might be a little bit warmer. So, anyway, so and there we go. So and since We've got uh, the um, hot sort of like reload. You can see that, oh, I'm reloading things. Um, and then we can try that again. Just time 70 again, submit. And you can see without restarting sort of like your back end or your web front end, you're good to go. So that's, I found quite a neat feature. So I believe they're using uh, UVCon, the ASGI, the asynchronous, whatever then the other letters stand for, gateway interface. Is it asynchronous gateway interface? Something like that. Um, sort of like um, the replacement of WSGI, um, less resource hogging and whatnot. So it's, it seems to be quite quite powerful. And I believe behind the scenes they're using Fast API as a, a sort of like as an API framework uh, because I managed to generate uh, an exception once and oh, something about Fast API showed up in the, in the stack trace. So. Can you look at the HTML source? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, it's yo and the script. Um, preconnect. Um, actually, what does it say here? It goes through, uses things from Cloudflare and whatnot. Yeah, so it seems to be doing mostly everything um, through JavaScript that it basically fiddles with your user interface and outputs then whatever you see then on the screen. Okay, that's that. The next one is sort of like a little image processing one. Um, all it does, the user selects an image and it applies a sepia filter to it and then displays that one again. So there's a little bit of NumPy magic in here. So it really has a very simple um, interface, really just input and output image. Um, here's the method again. Um, this time we're not using um, image in quotes. Uh, we're actually defining, we actually want to limit the size to 200 by 200. And, but for the output, yeah, whatever you get, display what, that image then. And if you wanted to um, sort of like limit sort of like the size and the output as well, then you could actually style it. So one thing that, so they have some limited styling where you have basically can go through all, um, object methods but apparently you can also attach CSS and whatnot 
which then gets applied to it. So you can actually customize it really till the cows come home. And I think it's probably what will take longest then, rather than writing your code. So when you run that then, basically have now a simple either picking or drop interface here so I'll just um, open here a dog since we're the Python user group a pack <laughs> sorry and then um, I see CPI applied to it and when I was looking at um, in here we can for instance output uh, what the type is because, I mean, it's nice that there's so much magic happening, but if you actually want to do something, what are you actually giving me? Because I thought, oh, I want to use that. So what is that? Is that pointing to the file? Do I have to load that myself? Or what is it? Or is it just the raw bytes? Um, so, yeah, detected the change again. Yeah, no. Oh. Sorry about that. Um, So if we reload that one, submit, so you can see down here that it's basically a num numpy, right? And if I wanted to see sort of like uh, what dimensions that is and whatnot, then I could output that as well. Um, put shape, wait for that to reload a bit. Look down there. So yeah, so we really limited to 200 by 200, and it's an RGB image, so it has uh, basically three channels. And yeah, so really, really easy. Um, about talked about blocks. Um, so rather than doing interface, um, you can also do here sort of like your with statement, where you then define, okay, I have my name, I have an output, um, and then sort of like you can change things in there. So if we're running that one then, so you have a bit more freedom in what you're actually doing then. So you now have that layout um, rather than side by side as we had earlier um, so it's underneath each other great cool and there's your output and um, rather than having the clear submit button and then the flag you really only have that particular greet button so what the interface class does underneath the hood i'm pretty sure basically actually calls blocks with a certain fixed layout, left and right side, do buttons here and whatnot, basic functionality, which probably, if you just want to demo something, is probably all you really need. But don't ask me too many questions about those blocks. This is just some example that I'm running here. Um, a bit more complex. So this is actually um, it's probably easiest to have a look at it first. More complex one. There we go. Okay. So you now have two tabs that you can work with. Do a flip. So it basically reverses your text. And if we have the image, use it the pug flip. You get it the other way around. So if we're looking um, at the 
the methods, so the methods themselves are very, very simple. Um, reversing a string and with NumPy, you just want to flip it. So left to right, so it's really, really simple. Um, but here, um, with blocks, you can then, first of all, have markdown text that you want to actually show. That's sort of like your text up here. So we could, for instance, um, make that bold. Along the text, see? So you basically have, so you can easy sort of like a little bit of, um, rather than just plain boring text. Um, and then you can basically just add tabs what you want to have. So you have your text box, which is the input, and a text box for output, and then a button that actually triggers things. So this is that. Um, if we're looking at that, there's actually even more down here. So you could have sort of like box where there's more content in there. So in this case, it's just a little bit of markdown. And then you are basically adding click events to those buttons. So you have, once again, your method, what your inputs are and what your outputs are. Basically what we've seen with the interface with a sort of like class, this is um, my method and here inputs and outputs. And this time we link a sort of like attaching that to buttons themselves. Once again, it fits on a single page, having an interface for flipping text and images. Um. So they have also ability for states. Um, this one I'm going to show you is about global state. At the end of the day, it's really just um, like a basically a global variable or mod module variable, uh, nothing else. But they also have session variables as well, support for that, since they're coming from hosted um, websites. We actually want to have a session with a user. We're actually doing things, interacting and whatnot. So it could be quite handy for that. I uh, haven't looked into that. Um, yeah, so in this case, here it's basically just tracking the score. So the users can enter multiple scores and the output will basically be the top three that you've entered. So here, track score. All it does is sort of like it sorts things, which is from smallest to largest, and then it does a reverse, basically of that, and then just give me the top three of that. Um, and then we just output that as JSON, which is another handy feature then, um, that you get a nice sort of like uh, collapsible JSON um, output there. Right. All right, so score on the last assignment out of 100 was 34. I wasn't particularly happy. Neither was the uh, lecture. Then I really studied hard and got 51. I still wasn't very happy. The lecture wasn't happy either. And then I had a really good night on the town the day before. It definitely didn't help. Uh, but then I really got my act together and I'm slowly getting there. And um, you can see I can also, in this number box, I can also then use these. And you can see, last test I got 99. And you can see it basically keeps nicely um, the three scores. And of course, you then also have copy to clipboard. Um, you could then just basically um, just have that if you wanted to take that somewhere, that output. Do you get the same numbers if you're accessing this from a different? Good question. Next question. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is something I run locally, um, but I would say so if 
you're running a single instance of that, then and you have a global state, yeah. from multiple sort of like people accessing it would basically be the same thing. Uh, being maintained as long as you have only one process running for doing that. If you're scaling that and whatnot, then that disappears once again. So you would have to have a backend. Um, but what you do as a backend, that's really up to you. And you're sort of like transform method. You can store things in the database and retrieve what's the last top three and then return that. So. Um, hmm. One other thing was that I mentioned is was the life interface. So all you change was basically an interface class that you have life equals true. So whenever there's a change in the user interface, it basically triggers sending whatever you currently have your parameters into your method. Of course, you have to be a little bit more cautious on the error checking side of things that you're not getting gibberish and then just crap out. Um, so that's, let's say, I mean, even users can submit garbage, um, but nonetheless. So in this one, we have a really, really basic calculator. So we have two numbers and an operation that we apply. And that's it. Um, so in this case, we have inputs. First one is a number and the second one is a number. And in between we have radio buttons. Once again, really, really simple. Um, I can then just list all my choices and then I get ready buttons. And the output is just a simple number again. Oops. If I could spell, that would be easier. Okay, so we have first number 20, second number is 23. If we add them, so we can see immediately things change over there. Or up that, or a change to subtraction, multiplication, division. Whatever I do, I don't have to do anything. It's really live. Um, which is surprisingly reactive, to be honest. Um, didn't expect that to be sort of like working that well. Um, and last but not least, um, one of the use cases was to show or to demo basically deep learning models or people call AI and hate that term, um, sort of like deep learning models. So what this little example from then does is, uh, which I modified a little bit, um, it instantiates basically, I don't know what they call it, um, exception net, since it's a mobile net. Um, ooh, change name. Um, Can I change? That's uh, all. Right. So it basically just instantiates a, um, a pre trained mobile net network, which is just a very simple and fast image classification network um, through the Keras framework, which sits on top of TensorFlow. Um, if it's not present, it will download it. Don't worry. Um, it uses some ImageNet libraries, uh, ImageNet labels, um, which it either downloads if it's not present, or I already have it present, so I don't download it as well. Because I think it's I don't know, like something like a thousand labels or whatever. Yeah, thousand labels. So that network is trying to basically identify a thousand different types of objects. On well, a fair amount of data, ImageNet is relatively um, large. Um, and yeah, read those labels in. And our method here is relatively simple again. 
Um, so we're getting our input, which is once again a NumPy array. I reshape that into a particular size that um, that mobile net wants. So it's 224 by 224 pixels RGB. Um, so basically, we do that, and then um, yes, please pre-process it, um, and then make a prediction and flatten that output prediction and then also return sort of like um, here for all the thousand labels that you have give me a dictionary of the human readable label and whatever your score was i mean they call it confidence but you know score confidence I mean, depends how you call it um yeah so what happens in our interface once again, we, class, uh, we reference our method that we are changing. Once again, an image is input, and this time we're already forcing it to be 224 by 224 pixels. And then um, we only want to output the top three classes in our label here. So there's something special here happening. And um, we're also loading um, examples that we're going to display, which is images. And these images, banana and car, are here. Um, and when I run that, first time, it will take forever because downloading or installing anything with ten, TensorFlow will take forever. TensorFlow, I think, is like half a gig uh, for downloading. The model itself is relatively small compared to that. Um, I don't have a GPU on there, so it's not that fast, but uh, MobileNet runs quite quickly, even on your CPU. All right. So you can see here's the two examples that are loaded. So you can basically just bring that in there rather than clicking on it. Submit that. Cool. 78% banana. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, don't think so, the spaghetti squash. Um, Beach Wagon, I think it's pretty good. I mean, it's a Dodge Charger, I think in 1967, but close enough. It's a car. Um, and well, we can see there's a car wheel, and it's that is actually, I could be a convertible. Sure, I don't think so. It's a I don't think so. It's a convertible, but um, yeah, so <laughs> already, so I can clear it or I can. Um, see what it, whether it can do anything with Puck, so it knows Puck as well. Uh, not a Griffin and definitely not a Bull Mastiff, even though it might think it is. Um, but yeah, so once again, um, you have a model, you can plug it in, so you can give that basically to people on, I mean, that hugging, hugging faces, that's the authors actually of the library. You can apparently also host it, so you can actually give just a public URL to people then, so you can deploy it there, and then people can just basically try it out there in theory. So it makes it really easy for sharing. And that's things, so you can see what happens here sort of like um, with uh, TensorFlow and background. So the first time around takes a wee while for warming up the network, but then even on a CPU, uh, it takes only 46 milliseconds to classify that particular image. I mean, it's a very small one, but still. Okay. Okay. That, let me stop sharing my screen here and go back to my presentation. Mm. So that was sort of like what I started out last night with after eight. I thought, oh, that's not too bad. Uh, let's have a look at the other one, textual. Um, with that one, it's really um, quite interesting because nowadays, I mean, everyone does everything web-based. Everyone's moving away from desktop application and whatnot. And then having a framework that is actually working in the terminal sounds like someone's going two steps backwards. And I thought, oh, that's quite cool. Um, so those guys behind Textual, they actually 
already had a library where you have rich text formatting in the terminal. So for a lot of, I could imagine that this is especially sysadmins always work in the terminal remotely on servers rather than fancy web interfaces, rather than just having gray on black or green on black and whatnot would be actually good if we had more functionality in there. And I mean, these terminals, uh, Windows didn't have support for that for a very long time, but all Linux terminals and whatnot always had very good support for things like that. So how about doing something like that? So they did that and it runs on Linux, Mac OS and Windows. I presume that's the PowerShell maybe. I don't think so, it's the command prompt. Um, and it not only supports sort of like the usual keyboard input, but also mouse. So if there's buttons, you can click basically on buttons or scroll bars and things so you can use your mouse. And you basically have true color with 16.7 million of colors that you can choose from. So plenty of uh, colors to choose from. So just like if you were actually in a web browser on, um, on the desktop, it has a layout engine. So if like you can have then funky layouts happening um, um, and since they have predefined widgets already, you don't have to start from basics. So it's a bit like in that sense, it's a little bit more elaborate compared to um, Red IO um, because it's here more really about designing sort of like desktop applications than one in a terminal. So with the basics, once again, it's just pip install textual. If you want to have development stuff in there, you basically have this uh, square brackets def in there as well. And then we're going to run a little um, demo there with Python module textual. It's quite cool. Um, and pretty much what you need for it is um, from three different modules, textual app, you basically import um, the class app and that's basically then you subclass that and then do something with that. Uh, compose result, that's actually the result of a, a compose method that actually makes up your user interface. Textual widgets, that actually has all kinds of widgets in there, button, label, footer, header, and so on. And then containers, that's for grouping widgets into other things. Um, and then which you can then enforce uh, layouts on top of it. And yeah, so the compose method really just returns an iterable of all your widgets and that's it. So compose result is really just a fancy um, typing annotation iterable of basically a widget and that's it. And then you have sort of like some, some types of events that you can do um, on keys. A key is being pressed, um, of course, in, uh, on input changed if anything in a text field, for instance, changes. Um, something gets deleted, oh, that should have been on button pressed, not OB. Um, and on mount, on mount means that the interface is basically being bootstrapped for the first time. Right. So with, um, so I've prepared some examples um, that we're gonna show through. So one is a very simple pride flag that's being displayed full screen in the terminal. Uh, calculator, a dictionary, which basically uses, um, as soon as you change something while typing, it basically fires off an API call to the dictionary api.dev um, with that particular word that you have and displays the results. And as far as I know, so it returns JSON and it turns that into Markdown, it displays that basically then. Um, a tree, which gets built from JSON, sort of like nice collapsible, uh, which is quite great. Um, and then also a Markdown browser. But maybe, yeah, okay, I'll look for that. I'm gonna share my screen. Full screen, share screen again. Quickly divide the other environment. Cool. All right. 
Okay, oops. On the examples one. I'm just going to make that full screen. Cool. All right, so the pride flag. So we can just go with Python. Um, I'm just going to actually rule. It's easier looking at it and then going through the code, what's happening. Cool. All basic generates is um, six different colors with the rainbow colors. And then you can control C that and you exit that. So if we're looking then at the code, all right. Also quite simple. Um, I mean, it's not really much to it. So you can see, here's our app class, which are pride app um, subclasses. Uh, we have some constants in here with our colors that we want to display. And you can see here's our compose method, which returns basically a compose result, which is just an iterable. And you can see um, that we're looping through our colors and we're creating sort of like a static element. Um, don't quite ask me what one of ours. I'm not really a web developer and they have their own sort of like CSS type styling that they offer. So it's like something um, that it does. And you can basically set the background of it. And then it basically does a yield. And depending on how many um, colors you have, you get more. And then, yeah, usual sort of like you instantiate your app and then just call it one. And that's it. So, I mean, we could have, if we change that, um, if we add something in here, we get that one in there. So, simple. Um, what do I want to do the next one? Calculator. All right. Oops, calculator. That one's a little bit more elaborate. Um, so you can see I'm moving my mouse around and it notices, so you get um, CSS styling for that. So if I, for instance, seven plus nine equals 16. And I can clear that. Seven, actually negative seven times nine equals minus 63. So, Ian, that's for instance for creating user interfaces for students. It's a good thing, so that's actually quite easy for doing something in here. If we're looking. It almost doesn't make sense. <laughs> that's like, what? Yeah. How's it doing that? That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a, it's a terminal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, yeah. it's not anything else. So, like, and, uh, so. I can resize it, so it's aware of that. So this is really not noticeable. So thanks, David, for, for forwarding me there. That was quite a good find. Um, so if we're looking at, at the code then, at the calculator, I mean, that has also CSS and whatnot then attached. So it, it goes a little bit further then. So there's a bit more to it. So in our compose method now, we have sort of like basically all the different buttons in here. Um, and um, you can give it IDs and whatnot. Um, so it does a few more things, um, has main name mappings and blah and whatnot. Um, CSS in there. So it has key events where it does actually stuff on. So it looks for uh, the button ID and then um, what happens here and, and um, button pressed. So there's a lot more happening. So it looks kind of like, oh, cool, that's not too bad. And then you look at the code and it's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, 
even if you look at a calculator, a uh, program in any other sort of like this sort of like whether it's PyQT or whatnot, it'll be more complicated as well. So it's not going to change anything there. So GUI code sometimes is horrible. But um, if you look at a use case, for instance, like with Red IO, where you have a web interface, you can select a file and then push it through something. You can basically have that then there as well, where you say, oh, please select a file, hit OK, and then display the output, for instance. Or just for submitting data, for instance, into a database, please select your timesheet. Done. And that was it, and it's submitted. Um, so you can do quite a few things. Yeah, sure. yeah. Where does it actually decide on the layout? You know, how does it put the, you know, the 8M plus minus and all that down the right hand So it does, a, it does a container. Yeah. So all the buttons are part of that. Um, and I presume that this is... So we have a layout, which is a grid. And then basically the, we have um, four, yeah, it's basically done via CSS then. Um, so it's, 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 it's a bit different. So because you can also use variables and things in there. So it's, it's sort of CSS. It's not, a, it's not the CSS that you know, but inspired by that with the same functionality so that you can either go by classes or um, IDs and things. What do you want to change? So if you're running it, so you have basically a grid of four. That's the calculator. Um, you have your buttons, they fill basically things. Um, numbers, um, there is a column span of four, that must be the, the top one here. Um, then, and they're sort of like zero, as a column span of two. So it's it's not everything is, I mean, you, you can probably um, just inline all your CSS as well, but it's probably easier if you wanna be able to tweak things to have it in a CSS file or sort of CSS file and then do things in there rather than changing your code all the time or if someone wants to have a slightly different color um, um, layout because they're colorblind, for instance, and you can just easily tweak your CSS and then, yeah, just drop that in here and that's it. And then, yeah. So that's with that. And nicely control C everything. Um, dictionary. Search for a word. Word of the day? What shall we look for? Python. Python. Now, a type of large constricting snake. Um, I didn't say that. Um, I might have to change that again. Okay. Shall we try boa? Um, any of a group of large American snakes, da 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 da. Plural boa is a type of scarf, typically made from feathers. So, yeah. If we are taking a look at the dictionary code, a little bit more in there, but it's not too bad. So once again, subclass of app, we are at uh, CSS's, but the um, Layout is not really easy because we basically just have one input at the top and then underneath we have sort of like a container which is marked down. And then on mount, so when the user interface gets constructed, we are focusing basically the edit field. And then we have sort of like async call. So whenever the input changes, we're basically looking up the word so we can actually test it um, not sure whether that actually, yeah, cool. B, adjective, having from birth or is from birth. Didn't know that. Um, bold. Interjection, an exclamation used to startle or frighten. I think it's, I thought there was boo, but um, 
a derisive shell made to indicate disapproval. Anyway, so it basically does, um, so it doesn't have to wait for an enter. So it can, can do things interactively um, and asynchronously with async IO basically. Um, and then it sort of like creates a task, look up the word. Um, so this is this one here, where it basically just uses the requests <coughs> um, library to make a call. Excuse me. And then if it's successful, it can, <coughs> it can then sort of like um, turn that into markdown. So if we're looking at the markdown thing, it's just simple. It just looks at, did we get a dictionary or did we get a list of dictionaries? So if you have multiple hits, for instance, for a particular word with meanings and you get a list of dictionaries and then you basically just go through meanings and then extract things, what you're getting actually out of it. So what we could do, for instance, is um, I mean, we could output things really. Um, Yeah, so from that point of view, it's it's really sort of like the conversion of what you've received as JSON is the largest chunk and then making the call. Your GUI is relatively small once again. And it makes sort of like really sense. It's, um, that sounds, uh, it's relatively straightforward. If we're looking at the CSS here, um, yeah, we have into, input, so it's a doc on top. The result sort of like it's 100% width and depending what um, sort of like is else on the screen, um, the results container sort of like just sort of like a margin around. Um, and then, yeah, sort of like what do you want to have border around it and whatnot. <clears throat> so, yeah. What happens when it fails? Like you put in ZX or something? Oh, yes, we can do that. It just compiles. Um... Sorry, pal, we couldn't find definitions. So, it actually, the API actually returns something, so it's a, well, whatever you're looking for it doesn't exist. So, uh, does that pre? Um... Um, so, you sort of like have a tr expandable tree that you can have. Um, so I can either press A and then it loads a JSON file um, food. Um, in those here sort of like a relatively long JSON file that it really um, adds to the tree. And you can do that multiple times if you want to. Each time it just adds a new node. So you can see, oh, okay, here's a product. And you can nicely sort of like really, remember, this is tech, this is a terminal. Um, you can sort of like here, or use the keys if you want to um, enter, closing, opening, um, and then go through. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really responsive. And I think I can also, drag this over here with my mouse and then go through. So all that you're sort of like expecting from, from um, a um, user interface. It's cleared. That's it. Um, last one is sort of like a markdown browser. And so sort of like here, kind of on the left hand side. Oh, sorry, I actually wanted to show what's actually happening in the um, diction and uh, the JSON tree. Um, so we're now importing from the tree widget a tree node as well uh, in the tree itself. And we are then, uh, when we're actually creating our user interface, it's really just a header and footer. So the footer contained our actions like add, clear, 
uh, and toggle. At the top, the header really just said, oh, tree. Uh, so if I chase a tree or something, uh, or root. And um, that's that. And then sort of like I can basically add JSON. Uh, this is actually done by a class method. Um, I have a particular node and the data to add to. Um, so this takes a wee while. Um, when it starts up, it just finds, it basically just loads the JSON data so it easily can just add things. Um, in the add action query one. So if if you've done J JavaScript and whatnot, you're basically looking for a type tree. Just give me the first one, basically, rather than a list. Give me just one object, and you can do basically do stuff with it. And then tree root call add JSON and bam, add me um, sort of like um, to this particular node that I created in there. Add me all that JSON data that you have and expand it. Clear, really just clears it again. <clears throat> and um, and I presume sort of like with query one and whatnot, you can probably also go via IDs if you have multiple elements. And you know this is the element that you're going for. Uh, probably also maybe query by ID. I haven't looked into that yet. Um, yeah, and then so with toggle, yeah, sort of like show root or not. And that's it. So, user interface wise, really, really simple again. And with your bindings, um, <clears throat> that's magic. Uh, maybe that's a that's a good question. Um, next question. Um, because we don't have anything else, so maybe that is some magic that happens if you have bindings that they automatically end up in the footer because historically you usually had in the footer like shortcuts and whatnot, mm -hmm. so it's quite possible that this is some magic happening here because you have um, the shortcut, the method name, and the text to display. So. Wouldn't be surprised if that's uh, happening then if you have a constant like that. All right, back to the markdown. So, really hyperlinking. And then you jump that way. So, you can pass things and whatnot. So, you see things in here. Now jump there. So, you have a browser. Um, Backwards or forwards with keys. Um, so if we're looking at um, that code, that will be slight. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more, but uh, not really that hard because the heavy lifting is done with a markdown view. We have once again our bindings. Um, it has a particular path, so which we've actually been looking at, and then once again we sort of like have um, we have a footer, and we have um, here our Markdown viewer, um, and then the Markdown viewer on startup gets the focus and craps out if if it can't find the path, but we're all good. Um, yeah, and then back and forward, and it's basically just calling methods of the Markdown Viewer. So I would say the Markdown Viewer has a slightly more complicated code behind the scenes that actually happens with parsing and whatnot, and I'm not sure what it actually uses, but I thought this is actually quite quite nice for actually displaying or reading documentation, mm -hmm. especially when you know, oh, okay, double, uh, double star, okay, it's bold, double star, okay, and whatnot, lists here and whatnot. So this is quite fancy, to be honest. And that concludes sort of like the examples that I had a look through. And I thought both of these, um, I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen. But with, with that screen, the markdown screen, yeah. I mean, that's all been generated by using VT100 escape sequence. Yeah. 
that in some way there's a <coughs> one of those apps or the textual yeah. yeah it must be this massive yeah. database of <laughs> well, CSI commands. Yeah, I mean they'd probably parse whatever hex codes that you usually have and then that gets regenerated in whatnot colors and whatever other VD100 sort of like escape sequences, this or all that. Mm. But I'm surprised that actually at the performance that it comes up with. And I mean, you have sort of like your um, your borders and everything, so sort of like the whole styling is there and it just works. And it's actually quite responsive, I have to say, despite me actually uh, sharing my screen as well, sort of like in. I mean, my CPU is basically using definitely one CPU, but that's sharing my screen. And the other thing didn't really show up as a blip. So, well, I mean, I saw some with the color, what were they, VT 240s or something, that, uh, or VT 340s with a, with a color mm. displays. And I saw people trying to you know, do stock exchange mm. screens and, and all different colors and all that. Mm. But no. <laughs> yeah, and this is like, yeah. I, um, we can actually try, um, I'm not sure what the demo actually does. So this is the, the demo, I'm still, I think I'm still showing my screen, yep. Um, so this is the demo, um, so you can see it's actually fading in the colors here on the button, right? It's not just... Mm. So fancy as well. Actual button, so changes color when I hover. Uh, apparently screenshot, not sure. Start. Okay, widgets. And I can scroll through here, so hmm, I can. Secret. Log in. Not that it does anything. Oops. Um, so let's scroll a bit further. Spreadsheet. Where you could display CSV or whatever, or a textual format, whatever you read, easily sort of like, rather than, oh my god, I have to go through the gobbledygook. Um, so you can have an easy sort of like view for stuff as well. And that sort of like really um, builds on the other sort of like, on that other library, Rich, where actually, where you can actually have this nicely displayed rather than having to do everything. And they are just, just, sorry, <clears throat> apologies for that. What well, they're basic, then building on top of that to have interactivity with that and a nice representation layer. And then, yeah, pretty printing of data is, is, is quite cool. Um, whether it's JSON and then here tables and whatnot here, you have different roles highlighting different colors and whatnot, so. Um, and then, yeah, so they have sort of like this, what I mentioned a bit, they have their own sort of like CSS type thing where they're loading in and whatnot. Um, it says easy to learn when you know CSS, it's, you think like, so what? <laughs> but you have to get your head around a little bit. But yes, so um, here's your menu sort of like where you can go through. You can even press F1 for help, notes. Um, Oh, you have a dark mode or a light, oh gee, or a light mode, um, you can toggle your side, you can have a sidebar or not, so yeah, and then put that. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite powerful and code-wise, yes, it is more than grad IO, but I mean, on the other hand, it gives you quite a lot of flexibility as well. And if you don't want to do a web interface, that's a really good alternative because for years I've been thinking of, should I ever look into N curses? And uh, I've never actually got around to it, but however, having that actually, I thought, oh, I might actually give that maybe a go sort of like for one of the other projects where I actually have to usually work on the command line on a server and actually have just a slightly nicer interface for doing yeah. stuff. So it's quite cool. All right, with that, I will be stopping sharing my screen. Any questions from the audience then? Nothing on chat. Or on the oh, yes, please. Uh, are you aware about the streaming uh, 
library. Which library? Extremely. Extremely? Yeah. No. Maybe that is similar to the data. Possibly, yeah. Um, I mean, with Python stuff, I usually do backend stuff, so I'm not really concerned with user interface as much. Um, most things that I deal with are command line interfaces, so I thought this is actually quite nice. And um, David um, in the online audience pointed that out, and I thought, cool, that's quite neat. So it follows that um, the React for React, like the JavaScript for React, mm. is sort of reactive UI of yeah. training with the yeah. same pattern. Yeah. But so it's reactive, that's true. But rather than having um, callbacks and all that, that's this is more like a traditional way, sort of like um, object oriented rather than functional, like React is, which suits me far better than looking at React code and think, what? Or having sort of like callbacks and callbacks and callbacks and callbacks is like, this just drives you nuts. How about sort of like some structured programming rather than, I don't know on which level I am. So what's the callback for this, for what other callback in, oh God. Yeah. Um, yeah. If some people like it, I'm not a big fan, but well, we have choice. So I'm, I'm good with that. If you did a, like a, an output, would you, read, instead of redirecting to your terminal, would it redirect to a file and then you could see all that? Um, think you went under the escape sequences. Oh, <laughs> don't ask me. Why would you want to? Oh, I'm, just, I'm just amazed. It's, it's, you it's can amazing. go, go <laughs> home and try that, and then sort of like. And they don't tell us. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, coming from those days, sort of like when you could do that. I said, oh, you can do that. I said, oh, sh that doesn't look very good. I'm never going to look at that again. So um, that was sort of like first time you start with Linux and you can sort of like tweak things with your command prompt, PS1 and whatnot. Oh, let's do this or that. And then, the, whoa, this looks ugly. Uh, this doesn't work. And then you just give up. I, I don't think it will work on Windows, eh? Because um, the Linux it's terminals, a, oh, maybe on PowerShell. PowerShell, I think. The command prompt, I don't believe so. But I think it might actually work on the PowerShell. Yeah. Or you could use the Windows subsystem. Yeah, program. and then it will work definitely, yeah. Yeah. Because the, um, <clears throat> the, the window, the, the command line Windows thing was pretty, it was, it was real basic. You know. Oh, yeah. 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 It was, it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. All right. And some of those those line drawing sequences, when he was doing the tree, yeah. that they are defined ASCII characters. Yes, yeah. yeah and, and they just get the right sequence. Yeah, but I mean, you still have to sort of like have a representation of that and then just yeah. the subtraction. So this is a tree, render, done. Yeah. I mean, knowing how much work is actually involved, it is like, so, whoa, yeah. this is pretty good. And then not on a graphical way, you can just have them draw. Nah, <laughs> this goes real basic. So I'm quite amazed. So there is some. Um... The tree utility for Linux, rather than doing an LS, yes. you do a tree, and it, yeah. it does that line drawing mm. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So that doesn't do colors or no, 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 anyway. or interactivity in that sense. Yeah. So it's cool. Very cool. All right. If there are no further questions from the audience, we will call it a night. Okay. And thanks everyone for attending, and hopefully see you next month. <laughs>